Welcome to today's webinar, the 2021 State of Industrial Cybersecurity. My name is Linda Duchin, I'm with Dragos Marketing, and we are delighted that you could join us for a very special webinar. We have an esteemed group of CISOs ready to join us and share their perspectives on cybersecurity. And before we get started, I just wanna go over a few housekeeping items. Next slide, please. So we are recording today's webinar and we'll be sharing that with you later this week. Uh, your phones are muted, but we would like to hear from you. If you have any questions, please use the Q&A tool at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And with that, I am delighted to introduce Sam Wilson from our product marketing team, who's going to moderate today's panel. Thanks, Linda. All right, let's, uh, let's start jumping into things. We have a, a fantastic session lined up today. Um, I'm so excited to have the panelists that we have joining us. Um, they're men that I look up to, and they have incredible industry experience. And there's some really interesting findings that have come out of this recent study uh, that was commissioned. Um, and what we'd like to do is kind of share some of those, those, key, those key findings with the audience today, but also get some firsthand perspective uh, from these guys that have had boots on the ground for a long time. So let's, let's just talk through what the study was, first of all. Um, so this was conducted by the, the Ponemon Institute. Um, they've been in, in the space of, of surveying um, cybersecurity leaders for a couple of decades now. Um, and they have a lot of different specialty areas that make them perfectly suited to get insight into how um, executives and managers think about cybersecurity, how they budget for it, how they prioritize, how they handle things like operations and risk, dealing with, with board issues um, and cyber incidents as well. So we, we really knew that they were the best uh, group to work with when it came to collecting this information. We got back uh, roughly 600 results, uh, surveys that were completed by OT and IT practitioners. Uh, and this was anywhere from the managerial level up to the C-suite. Uh, they were all familiar with ICS OT operations um, within their organizations and in many cases, other places they had worked. Um, and these were all based in the US. All right, just for some quick demographics, the, the breakdown of the survey respondents, uh, you'll see here, there's a range of different um, levels within organizations that the people responded uh, right up to the most senior uh, down through, through uh, contractors and, and consultants. But in all cases, these are people that have some responsibility and a lot of uh, hands-on experience uh, with cybersecurity in ICS and OT. There were a number of different industries uh, that uh, were included. Um, so hopefully, wh whichever industry you represent uh, within your place of work uh, is, is shown here. Um, but this gives us a nice, rich uh, cross-section of insight uh, so that we understand if there's influence from a certain industry, uh, how might that show up in, in the survey results? And then in terms of the size of the organizations, uh, again, these range from you know, the smallest of companies up to Fortune 50 companies. So there's a very good um, set of demographics that we're pulling from. I, I didn't mention up front that um, you can register after the webinar if you already haven't. Uh, to receive a full copy of this report. We'll just be highlighting um, some of the, the key things from the report today. There isn't time to go over it in detail, but we would like you to be able to um, you know, get the full details and, and then uh, as needed, follow up with us if there's questions about how to apply this within, within your own uh, current place of work. So what we'll do, um, because there's always interest around how do we compare to other organizations? We've got a very simple, uh, polling slide that we'll bring up and we'll give the audience uh, a few seconds to respond to it. We'll share the results um, and then we'll start diving into some of the findings from the survey.
Great. Okay. So everyone should be able to, to see that right now. There's a really interesting cross section. There's no right or wrong answer here. And what we find in speaking with their customers is that people are at every stage of the journey. Nobody is where they want to be. Ultimately, there's always room for improvement. And I think we'll hear from our panelists that this has definitely been the case for them over the course of their careers. So let's, uh, let's start jumping into things here. Now, I, I wanted to share as well that today's my birthday and I could have been spending this like diving in the Grand Bahamas or somewhere, but uh, I can't really dive. So why not spend it with all of you on, on, the, on the line today uh, in this, in this, uh, this webinar? Um, so there's, there were a number of key findings um, that came out of, out of the survey. And, and let's start with the perceptions of IT and OT um, and how they align. Uh, out of the respondents, roughly 50% said that they felt optimistic about the future of their OT cyber programs. So I don't know if that's a glass half full or a glass half empty response, but I guess the point here is that um, some people are not feeling very good about things. And uh, no surprise, given some of the recent events uh, that have hit the news, um, how we're being stretched thin for budgets, uh, all competing for resources, some of the other issues that we'll talk about today around uh, talent and, and skills challenges, who's responsible, these all create a lot of tension uh, for, for organizations to deal with. And, and somewhat similar to the poll results that we just had, uh, only 21% felt that their organizations uh, had, to re had achieved full maturity. Now, I'd love to talk to some of those people directly. We don't know who each respondent was, um, but this is encouraging. It means that the industries are starting to mature and move in a direction that's really necessary. All of you on, on the line today, you know, you're, you're doing things that the general public probably doesn't fully appreciate, may not fully understand. Um, but we, we as a company recognize the contributions you're making to the community and we, we greatly appreciate the time you've taken to join us today, but also what you're doing in your workplaces to keep, you know, water flowing, lights on, and keep families safe. It's just such an, such an important part of how we operate as a, as a society today. There's a few, uh, a few general kind of key findings that we'd like to, to discuss. Um, you've all, I'm sure all of you have heard about the, the IT OT gap uh, and, and the great divide. Um, this was one of the themes that did come out in, in the survey. Uh, there's definitely um, very real cultural and technical differences between IT and OT. A couple of examples that were cited had to do with things like patch management. Um, you know, ICS vendors, uh, they need special access to their equipment, and that creates a number of different security challenges that IT teams may not have to deal with or may not have to protect the same way. And then also, when it comes to um, how, how do organizations um, really effectively discover or maintain an inventory of devices on their network, uh, only 45% said that they felt they were, they were highly effective. Uh, this, this might be a surprise to some people, but in fact, when you have large complex organizations that span geographies, span acquisitions, uh, you've got turnover, um, hardware isn't accounted for properly, things may not be commissioned correctly. Um, it's no wonder that sometimes we don't really know everything that's on our network, or even if we do, we're surprised by something that might pop up. And then lastly, when it comes to um, how effective these organizations are at gathering threat intelligence within their, their, IT, their ICS or OT environments, Roughly the same percentage, 46% felt that they, they were really effective. So that shows us that there's, there's still a gap that needs to be addressed somehow. And we'll talk more about that today. Now, this one's interesting uh, because not all of this would actually make the news. Uh, there's headlines that are sensational, but there's a lot of ser like serious pain behind the scenes that goes on both at the practitioner level and at the, at the leadership level. And we recognize this because when we surveyed uh, people on, on this, this particular point, 63% said that they had had some kind of cyber incident in the past two years, more than half. And it's possible this number is even greater. So just for definition, um, the way that, that Panaman defined a cybersecurity incident in this case 
Uh, it's a violation or imminent threat or violation of, of computer and document security policies, acceptable use policies, or standard security practices. An incident could involve the theft or misuse of both electronic, digital, and paper documents that contain sensitive or confidential information. We have a table in the full report that you can take a look at as well, where we calculate the average cost per cybersecurity incident. This is a combination of things like how many people get involved, uh, what their average hourly, average uh, annual salary might be or their hourly sa salary. Um, and this, this number does not reflect uh, lost revenue. So this is just the operational cost of a cyber incident just south of $3 million uh, US. Now, this can be a lot less or a lot more um, if there's any, any penalties or fines, uh, which in some industries there, there could be, uh, the number could be a lot greater than this, but you know, roughly $3 million. So this is not a trivial amount. And when we looked into who had responsibility um, for the ICS or OT cyber programs, uh, interesting was that the VP of engineering was the by far the largest response that we got around 25% versus the, the CISOs in, in the organization, uh, the chief information security officers, roughly half. So I don't know if our, our CISO panel has any feelings on that. We'll get to that in a few minutes. Um, maybe they're just so uh, good at what they do, they can do more with less. I'm not sure. But we, we thought that was a very, a very interesting finding. And kind of related, um, they, we, we found that there was this kind of uncertainty or this lack of clear ownership around who, who was really responsible for cyber risk within these different, this, these different ICS uh, uh, groups and, and the companies that they, that they worked for, 43%. Uh, so if there's a lack of certainty, uh, maybe the, the accountability is not what it needs to be as well. So we'll talk through some of those implications before we're done. All right, well, I'm very happy to introduce our guest panelists on, on the webinar today. These gentlemen represent decades, and I mean like decades of industry experience. They're all fantastic guys to work with. It's been a delight getting ready for this webinar. Uh, I look forward to this discussion. So in order, we're gonna have Sean Gerber from Invista, Paul Reyes from Vistra, Doug Short from Trinity River Authority of Texas, and our very own Steve Applegate. Um, so, gentlemen, if I could maybe ask you in order on screen here, if you could just introduce yourselves, uh, a quick word or two about your career, and maybe something about your business, and then we'll start going into uh, some of the, the, the key panel summary slides next. Sounds great. Uh, thanks, Sam. Uh, my name is Sean Gerber. I am uh, with Invista. We are a subsidiary of Coke Industries, uh, which owns many different companies uh, around the globe from Georgia Pacific, Molex, uh, Infor, and so forth. So we're one of the companies that is associated with Coke Industries. And uh, our company deals is industrial and deals primarily in the chemical industry. And so we have business that is pretty much uh, all over the globe from China, North America, and in Europe. Um, my, a little bit about my background. Um, I started off as a military aviator, uh, used to fly B-1 bombers, and I flew a little bit with the Navy, and then transitioned to be a commander of a red team for the U.S. Air Force. I uh, did that for about 10 years um, and dealt with various aspects from penetration testing to full-on um, aspects of, of getting into facilities and so forth. So different view from that perspective. And then I came to work at Coke Industries, and I've been working as a security operations center manager, uh, architect, and then also as a CISO for one of the Coke companies. About total years, I've been doing this for about 20 some years. Great, thanks, Sean. Paul, do you mind going next? Sure, uh, my name is Paul Reyes. I'm the Chief Information Security Officer for Vistra Corp. Um, I've been with Vistra now 12 years, and for the last five years, I've been over cybersecurity risk and compliance. Prior to that, my, my uh, background is really founded in infrastructure and operations. So I've had over 30, 30 years plus uh, in IT itself with my first 10 years in the Air Force, very similar to Sean. And, and in there, I was uh, with technology within an Intel group for the 10 years I was in. And then uh, from there, I left in 20 plus years now in the private sector. Um, back in 2009 is when I joined Energy Future Holdings, which is now Vistra Corp. Um, a company 
is uh, based in Dallas. It is uh, really uh, the um, portfolio of competitive energy brands. Vistra has a competitive business uh, providing more than 39 uh, megawatts of generation across multiple platforms of, of uh, fossil fuel as well as renewables and nuclear. And then we also have our approximately around 5 million retail customers in our retail side of the house with multiple brands. Great, thanks, Paul. Uh, and Doug, do you mind going next? Sure, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Doug Short, the Chief Information Officer and Chief Information Security Officer for Trinity River Authority of Texas. And I've been here for just over seven years. Uh, as an organization, we operate nine regional water and wastewater plants a dam on Lake Livingston. And interestingly, we just uh, partnered on our first hydroelectric project and did a ribbon cutting there a couple of weeks ago um, and an RV park on the lake just for fun. Uh, Trinity River Basin runs from just north of Fort Worth, Texas, all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico. And we include both the Dallas Fort Worth and most of the Houston metropolitan area in our basin. So if you look at what we do, we, we serve directly about a million customers with water and wastewater treatment and providing uh, uh, water and wastewater services to our customer cities. And indirectly, we serve about half the population of the state of Texas through management of the Trinity River resources. So interestingly enough, I, I also uh, spent a lot of time in the Air Force. I had about 28 years in the Air Force. Uh, started off in security and then went into uh, IT as, a, as an officer. And then uh, from there into cyber operations. So I was blessed at the time to run the cyber operations schoolhouse down in Mississippi and also to work on the joint staff to uh, help define cyber policy for DOD, uh, working with the interagency at the national level and also working on national critical infrastructure policy and and operations. So happy to be here today. Thanks, Doug. And, and I'm sure that you're glad that hurricane season is over now as well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. And with a beard so great, let's uh, let's go to Mr. Applegate last year. Go ahead, Steve. Got it. I guess I'll round out our, our Air Force veteran panel. We I think that was accidental, but I also have began my career as a as a military man in the Air Force. Uh, I started in 1988, uh, right out of high school, enlisted, and and I worked at NORAD. Um, back then, IT, you know, IT and security were really one field, at least from my perspective, and uh, it was just like a subset of IT. So I did crypto access control, um, some early network security and audit, audits and things like that. So I've pretty much stayed in, in a security role from that point until now. Um, I stayed in DOD for about 10 years um, as an as a enlisted and then it went on to be a, a contractor. And then I did a lot of really cool projects. I got my feet wet with um, ICS at, during that 10 years also uh, before it was even, you know, something that we thought about in, in the security world. Um, I transitioned to the private sector. I worked mostly from that point in energy and a little bit in manufacturing. Uh, pretty much every role I had, it, it dealt somewhere with OT support and or ICS security. Um, my most recent roles were as a VP, Deputy CISO at PepsiCo and, and um. I was a security leader at Marathon Petroleum in Saudi Aramco before I joined Dragos a year ago as uh, CISO here. Thank you for the time, Sam. Thanks, Steve. I think NORAD's famous for the Santa tracker. Is that right? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I, can't, I can't talk much about the program. It's still classified. Oh, we, yeah. we did track Santa very closely. Yeah. Well, that's that's a that's a great background from from everyone on your company. So I, I appreciate that, and uh, I hope that we have a chance to talk more in future webinars together. But let's let's start going through some of the the themes that came out of out of the survey responses. Um, the first one I'd like to get into, and this really has to do with uh, different blockers to investment in ICS and, and OT. So one of the questions here had a number of responses. Uh, there were some very uh, kind of clear uh, groupings that came out of it, and one of them has to do with whether you know the engineering department um holds the the budgets and whether they have uh the right level of expertise around cyber or you know does it have enough understanding of of operations um and whether they're both working effectively together so this isn't new we've we've heard this uh for a while and maybe some of you have been on other panels before talking about these differences who has the budget how do you decide where to invest but maybe Sean, uh, could you just kick things off? When did you first realize how different IT and OT are and how does it 
how would it impact uh, the responses to a question like this? Yeah, I'd say my first introduction was when we had a, a situation back in the Air Force where we were asked to go uh, go after some labs, and we targeted a the, at that time they called it the SCADA environment to understand how does that work on a on a uh, power generation facility, and I, I didn't really totally understand it. I dealt with IT for a while, but didn't understand the whole the sensitivity and also the the criticality of these SCADA environments. Uh, so that was when I first learned it. And then as I've went through my career, I've learned that that same point where you talk about the difference between IT and an OT knowledge base is there is a pretty big gap. And it without really, I mean, one was with myself and then also talking with the OT folks, they didn't have a full understanding of IT. And, and it really came clear just between those two organizations that even though they still dealt with many of the same ones and zeros, the, the language was a different enough that it caused confusion and people just didn't quite totally understand it. So that, I'd say the first time I realized it was with the Air Force, but it's been steadily seeing more and more of it as my career progressed. Anything from other panelists around uh, when they realized that these two beasts were not the same? Yeah, so I'll, this is Doug, I'll, I'll go ahead and, and just give a, a little bit of perspective from our point of view. So. Um, I had a little understanding from my time at the uh, Pentagon and my time at, uh, at the schoolhouse, but really everything kind of hit home whenever I came into what is really an OTIT environment here and um, got to see that there's a whole different perspective. You know, the OT guys look at things from a different perspective than we traditionally did in IT, right? So in IT, security is, is king and OT availability and ability to operate is king there. So I think that's one of the most important things that, you know, you kind of have to grasp. Um, and here I, I'm actually responsible for both sides of that equation. So getting those those teams to work together was uh, key to success. There's a question that came in uh, that I, I'd love to just raise to the panel as well. Uh, so this is from from Mike uh, in our Q&A. Um, so, so Mike asked, um, to what extent does a panel perceive that IT and OT gaps, especially around patching and asset management are being reinforced by OEMs who, who, who dictate what the ICS owners can and can't do with their equipment. Uh, maybe just share some, some, some anecdotal evidence or stories around how the vendors add complicating factors to this I, the ITOT mix. I, I can add something on that one. Um, so we've, in, in previous life, we've dealt with, and we've seen this change with the OEMs as well, uh, some are very ardent on the fact that they aren't going to change unless you come to them with a lot of money and a lot of resources to do it. They, they're not going to get into the same level of understanding as, as the IT environment does around patch management. However, we have seen some vendors um, change substantially in they have taken on more of they understand the need for this because in some respects, as the new requirements from the governments are coming in, it's holding them responsible. And I think that's, as they become held more responsible for the OT environment, it's gonna change that thought process and paradigm. But I've seen it change. Uh, Schneider's a good one that has actually been wanting to change um, in different areas. And they've actually been leading ahead in innovation aspects around this piece. So I, I think as more time goes on, we're gonna see more of it, especially as there's other governments that are forcing their hand. Yeah, and, and I'm agreeing with Sean. Um, I think that you've seen that lately in the last, you know, four years where cyber has been really in the news. You have, you know, the colonial pipeline type of stuff and, and, and you start to become really aware and, and asking a lot harder questions. And I think third parties are realizing they have a, a big play in this because uh, they are that third party risk where you have a trusted partner that's inside your control area, right? And so, uh, this is a challenge. We, we normally aren't going to sit there and think that we can patch everything, even though our cyber teams all want to go patch everything. But th there's a balance between that risk tolerance and, and being able to describe where is the right way to do it and where you just need to monitor and passively detect the changes that are occurring so that you don't disrupt your business. Yeah, I, I could um, add, you know, directly related to the question, um, you know, we're a capitalism. And it makes and, and I heard people predicting someday, you know, uh, security is going to be embedded in the products and the, and the, the products, the product companies are going to have security teams and they're going to sell these services. And there was a lot of naysayers at the time, but it did happen. And I don't, don't necessarily think it's a bad move, um, but, but at the same time, 
you know, people have to be able to walk on their own feet and they have to build their own internal savvy. And, and if it's the kind of thing where uh, a vendor makes it where you have to go through them to do certain things that are really just base level foundational security things, then it, I feel like it could still hinder uh, the progress of an internal team. And, but directly, indirectly, I, want to, I also wanted to add that operational risk has to be considered in all this since we're talking about patching you know, and a vendor maybe at one time was counter to patching. I'm kind of counter to patching myself in an OT environment. It was one, you know, one, one particular job I had. It was one of the early things I did as a security leader of the OT group. I stepped up and said, you know, no more mandating patches. Let's step back in time a little bit. Let's, you know, because we were, I was seeing patches take down equipment. And if you're introducing operational risk, it, everything we do has to be a risk-based decision. So if we, if we are going to, I don't want to point fingers at the vendors and say they're stopping us from patching. That sometimes it's a good thing to slow people down and and make everybody you know consider the risks as you're going forward, operational and cyber. I guess it's it's a good point, Steve. I think vendors are quick to jump towards pat, patching as a solution, but as you would know and the other panelists, there are different compensating controls that might be more appropriate within OT environments. Yeah. Okay. Well, great discussion. A lot of questions coming in around some of these same topics, but we've got a bunch to get through. So. I'm going to jump to the next uh, the next slide and the next set of questions, and this this has to do with what we you know hear as the the talent gap or the talent crunch, um, and one of the themes that emerged from the question we had here on the screen, um, we we discovered that one of the big challenges really has to do with hiring experts uh, who have the the skills and expertise. So finding them in the first place, um, attracting them if you're trying to fill positions. And then hanging on to that key talent, and then secondly, if you have good people already in place, um, how do you how do you train them? Do you expand their skills into cybersecurity? Um, and so, I think there's some really interesting themes here that we're seeing across a number of different industries. But Paul, maybe I, I could just kick this over to you for a second. Uh, would you agree or disagree that good OT cyber uh, talent is hard to find, and why? I absolutely agree. Uh, I, in my organization, I have three pillars, and one is an IT organization wrapped around uh, corporate and retail. And then I have a dedicated, you know, generation arm that does all cyber risk and, and, and cybersecurity for our generation fleet. And then third is a compliance organization that goes across all. And, and from that perspective, it is very difficult to find our ICS resources in there. And, and we, we our, our approach is we focus on the business first. And so we look at people that have been and understand a critical infrastructure type of model. And, and we have several on our team that are mechanical engineers by background, some that come from the plant. So we look at also having a pipeline of growth from a plant up into technology, those that are interested. And so we offer that up to it. And so we've, uh, matter of fact, this last year, we've added two people that came from an ICS um, background, uh, you know, being in the HMI um, piece and brought their skill sets over to us. And then we taught them the rest. And that's by far the best model in which we do uh, because the other puts you at a lot of risk where somebody that's really IT oriented can go and then wreak havoc into a business unit out at a, at a plant and take down a plant and never get invited back. Interesting. So I, I heard you, I, I think what I heard you say was it's easier to take someone who's already in ICS and operations and add security to their, their mix, to their skill set. Would you say it's easier to do that than take someone from IT uh, with a cyber background and move them into an OT cyber position? Yeah, it seems like we move slower when we do it that way. Um, and, and the challenge is because they have to then understand the culture of the business. And, and that's really all built around relationships. I mean, you got to start thinking instead of just being secure, you got to think about being safe. How do you make sure that you understand safety means lives? to be at risk. You know, safety means that a turbine can take down and explode the, the whole system you're screwing up. So yeah, I think that challenge of slowing people down makes them feel like, okay, I'm not really moving fast. And so that's been, been a, a bigger challenge for us to, to move in that direction. Yeah, this this next question, it's, it's a little bit loaded and it's sort of, uh, it's one that I think the answer might be a bit obvious, but let's let's talk through it anyways. Um, does does the panel feel that we we need dedicated OT cyber practitioners um, in every uh, industrial company, or can we can we get by with 
upskilling people with uh, that are wearing multiple hats? Is it realistic to expect that you can be a generalist or do we need specialists? I, is that for, oh, go ahead, Sean. Um, I, I have my, my feelings on this because there's a couple different thought process around it. When, when flying airplanes, we had a choice when we moved from airplanes to being a group of hackers, I had to train wrench turners on how to basically become a hacker. hacker. And it can be done. Um, the, the point of it, it, but a lot of it is the OJT piece of it. Uh, do I feel that OT practitioners need to be specified for every industrial area? No, just because there's not enough of us to do that. Um, and I do feel that I'm a generalist. My background is not in IT at all. It's in flying. But the, the point of it is, is that you, if you understand the basics and the foundations and to what Paul mentioned about the culture, I think anybody can do this. It's just they have to have a passion and a desire to do so. Yeah, yeah sure. uh, Go ahead, Paul. <laughs> yeah, what, what I'll add to it, and, and I totally agree with Sean, I think the capability is there, but this is a huge debate in my organization, because I've tried to say, hey, you know what, for all the synergies that we're trying to do, let's combine some of the field support that are in the IT side, and I combine them with our ICS group, and it's a, the, the biggest challenge is focus. So when you get to become a generalist in IT, you have all the priority of the corporate and all the other things that are coming at you for uh, impacting your timeline. But yet we segregated a, a SCADA system group specifically dedicated to that because it's an important part of the business. We didn't want them distracted with anything else. So it's really, I guess, we, we think it's more around focus, not capability. We think that you need to have them separated because they are focused on the business and ensuring the business comes first than anything else. And that's probably the only, the only thing I would probably say that needs to be separated and why. I'm sorry, Doug, go ahead. No, thanks. Um, and I, I would just jump right on top of that. I agree 100% with what both of you are saying. And I think when we talk about focus, uh, interestingly enough, going back to the military background, you know, uh, it's an operational focus. It's what is the primary mission? You have to, we have to teach our IT people that the primary mission for the authority is to provide clean water to our customers, right? It's not to make sure that server lights are blinking and you know uh, a finance report runs 100% on time every time. Our primary focus is operational and providing clean water to our customers. And once we get by that, then we can start utilizing some of those IT skill sets to supplement what's happening over on the OT side of things. And I think you know that's one of the things that you know back to it's a cultural battle, right? We have to we have to number one get invited into the ICS. And that was a struggle for me when I first got here and then be able to provide value to them. Because if you can provide value to those guys uh, out in the OT environment, they'll invite you back every day. Um, if you don't, or if you hinder their progress, they are gonna be the worst roadblock you've ever imagined. I, so I would take a little different angle in answering this. I don't disagree with anybody. I, I wish I could so we could make this exciting. I'll get a little fight going here. But I, I, everything you say, everybody's you're making total sense to me. But a couple of points I would pull out of this, and which may be kind of pedestrian, but first of all, security is a, it has to be a culture. For proper governance, you can't say, here's three security people. You go protect our billions of dollars of revenue, and you protect our thousands of employees. Security has to be baked into everybody's job description. If you have this team of people and say, there, security is solved. Now those people do security and then other people are undermining the security by their operational, you know, uh, yeah, I was trying to soften it from ineptitude, uh, carelessness or whatever. They're, they're bypassing controls. They're so worried about the mission that they are running unauthorized connections. They have some savvy and, they, and they're like, hey, the mission must go on. They do something and they leave it in place. And then later you find a modem or you find some rogue internet device. You're like, okay, wh why was there an access point here? This shouldn't be here, you know? So to me, it's, it takes a village. It, everybody has to have security baked in and, and tied to that. Um, I, you, you have to have, I feel like you can't say we're centralized security. We have a CISO in one group of people. I think it's, there's parts that have to be centralized. I, I'm, I'm sure there's uh, exceptions to this pro to this statement, but you know, most companies don't have an ICS area and enough OT to say, we're going to have, you know, a, a SOC, access control, all the different functions that are required for, for proper, you know, awareness. You want a special awareness team for OT? 
So a lot of that stuff, some of that stuff you say, Look, let's have that centralized. Then we'll have the, the people that re accept all this guidance from the central group that actually go and harden the devices and that implement tools and maintain standards and help build the standards and so, some sort of a collaborative approach. So I, I feel like if I, and it's probably, you know, a little bit too vague, but by and large, I think that it takes a hybrid kind of a setup where something or some stuff is centralized and some is decentralized and pushed out to the, to the uh, units, the business units themselves to maintain. Yeah, that's, that's fair. I mean, I, I think in, in some cases when, when people do those things that make, you know, turn your hair whiter, or just make you cringe, it's because they don't know what they don't know. Right. So as, as we move from, you know, people running with scissors or as, as Sean called them, the, maybe the wrench turners, what, what's a realistic time frame uh, in your in your experience for someone to go from not really having any experience or practical knowledge of uh, of ICS or OT cyber to being uh, proficient and actually contributing and, and competent? What would be a reasonable time frame you guys have seen? You know, I, for, for the senior people, I like that 10,000 hour rule, you know, somebody that's been dedicated for five years or whatever. But I, I also find value in even just a person that's a direct recruit straight from IT or from engineering for certain roles and you know, having that diversity of thought and, and you know, flavor. Because if you have a bunch of people that came from the same background, I think you're going to be limited. Yeah, we, we brought in an interns and, and within six months, they were very fluid in their conversationalist aspects and and realistically i think one of the questions that's in the chat talks about uh which i'm get i didn't go my get my cisp i went to the cisa route it, it really doesn't matter is, is in my perspective that's more for hiring it's more of can you converse with the can you i'd like to say bring it to the third grade level can you bring it down and converse I, ics language into it language and into leadership language if you can do all of that then it can take six months as long as you're willing to learn. It, it doesn't take long. So is is there is there a place for someone coming into the workforce with just textbook knowledge? Because what, what I'm hearing is you want to have people with practical hands-on understanding um, and not just what they're doing in the classroom. But is is there is there a career path where you could maybe get some formal education outside of the industry? and then enter in as, as a junior worker within within ICS cyber? I wouldn't say go straight into an architect role or, or an engineer. <laughs> as an analyst, a technologist, a technician, you know, a, a technical writer, an analyst, I think that, that there's a perfect place for that. Uh, yeah, and, and as Steve mentioned, uh, having uh, interns, uh, we've had several interns, in, or, or I think it was maybe Sean, uh, having interns that within six months, they kind of get proficient. And we've hired uh, some of our interns after that that says, hey, you, you understand the culture, you understand where we're going, you're asking the right questions, and, and make sure that they, they understand that flow of business to technology. And uh, it was worked well. Yeah, and I, I would add on to that. So, you know, I ran the cyber schoolhouse for two years in the Air Force. Um, and that we would get people with bachelor's degrees that would come in, um, you know, and I was the first person to, to graduate a class from the cyber schoolhouse when we went to a, an operational focus. And we would get people in there, uh, some with computer science degrees, some with accounting degrees, some with history degrees, political science. So I think really it's individually focused, right? So if you can give people the basics of you know, what IT is, what security controls are, how the networks run, infrastructure, et cetera. And then you can put them into the workforce at a entry level, but you have to make sure you have the experienced people then to set the guardrails around them so they don't drive the car off the road, right? Because you want them to stay within those guardrails and you want to be able to mature them and progress them so that they can fill those mid-management mid and senior roles and more technical roles down the, down the road. And there's there's so much sage wisdom in those responses. I, I just feel like you guys are talking right through the hearts of a lot of the people that are in, in the audience. I, I know, for example, one person shared that they had been working in the industry and were so discouraged and beaten down that they had to leave. Uh, they didn't feel like they had the, the understanding from their management team. So just be aware that what you're sharing here, you're, you're talking into the, the lives of tomorrow's uh, OT cyber, you know, frontline workers and, and leaders. So this is this is uh, this is fantastic. I'm I'm really enjoying this, guys. Well, I'd say I'm on a quick note on that. I, I would say that person, whoever that is, 
Um, there's so many opportunities out there. Go get a new job at a different place. Because yeah. I mean, <laughs> they're they're hurting for people. You just need to find the right company to go work for. That's right. And uh, John, I'll, I'll, I'll give out your personal phone number after that. <laughs> say, can we recruit? We can recruit. I actually have two openings. <laughs> I think we all have openings, right? So if anyone's looking for a job, please reach out after. There's definitely opportunities. Okay. Um, this is one of the other interesting themes that emerged, and this has to do with cyber incidents and, and ransomware. I want to make sure we have some time to, to talk through this. So as I mentioned earlier, you know, 63% of the respondents, doesn't mean 63% of all organizations, but out of those who responded, said their organizations had some type of ICS or OT cyber incident in the past two years. This is alarming. And I would, I would also um, uh, you know, feel comfortable stating this number is probably going up. As things become more hyper-connected, as the complexity increases, um, some of the different supply chain issues we're seeing, there's a lot of different um, factors that influence uh, why security is becoming harder over time in some ways, even if it's getting better in others. So this number is probably going to stay or you know go up over time. But more specifically, and this is in the news a lot lately, um, almost 30% said that they had experienced a ransomware attack in the past two years. Um, and out of those that responded to that, the average ransom paid was about half a million dollars, so five hundred thousand um, dollars. So, Doug, I, I don't know if if you've had to deal with this directly or not, but I'm I'm curious. Do do you feel like the general public really understands why ransomware is a big deal, specifically for critical infrastructure providers? So I, I really don't, um, and, and to just speak about this more generally, um, I, I don't think that any, many people understand cyber risk in general. So unfortunately our culture has been gone to a place where what we have now are 30 second or one minute news bites that are uh, hyper exaggerated as to what's going on out there without having even gathered all of the facts of an incident. So, um, Really, the I mean, the cyber risk and the that discussion has to lie in the more mundane details. Like, let's get our workforce trained. You know, let's let's look at things like patching, uh, access management, et cetera. All those, you know, controls that nobody wants to talk about that aren't sexy. Um, but I don't think the majority of the public understands cyber risk at all. And unfortunately, I don't think a lot of our political and uh, uh, corporate leaders really understand cyber risk very well. And, and Paul, maybe if I can ask you, what's, what's the temperature been? Uh, what's your experience with how the, the public understands the impact of ransomware on your industry? And how do you, how do you explain to someone so they, they have some, some empathy for what you're dealing with? Yeah, I think lately uh, it's been growing because uh, there's a lot more questions on our side of the house uh, for, you know, hey, what's going on with ransomware, especially when you got so much that's in the news. Five years ago, di much different story. It was just a push and pull around there trying to get them to be engaged. But I, I think uh, having, it's a different story when somebody has actually been very close, whether their company has been through a ransomware attack or they've lost their identity or something. And, and when they had that, it, uh, you know, that impact, then they kind of have a lot more um, empathy around understanding the work that goes to protecting the environment. I've been fortunate that our company has a very keen eye on risk and what does it take to avoid any of these types of activities. And we have that constant conversation that communicates out that says, hey, you know, what is the potential possible issue that it could occur when a ransomware attack comes? And if so, how do we equate that to something else? Like we in Texas here, we went through, you know, Storm Uri. That was a big eye-opening item. We equate that same type of crisis management to what if this was a, a ransomware type of attack that kind of created that same scenario? How do we respond? Because they're very similar outcomes at the end of the day. You know, you're, you're in there putting people's lives at stake. You're, you're either, you know, um, crumbling your generation uh, aspects of it. So those similar responses then can correlate to the risk aspects. And I think that's what we as practitioners have to do is really start talking business language around how does cyber correlate back into a risk that the business understands. I really like one thing Paul said about uh, like a before and after. Just, just one. If, if we could look back, I like it all. It's all good. 
if you could, I, I wish that we could now pull people and say, bef, you know, how much did your budget, how much did your program change? How much more are you reporting to the board now that you've suffered from ransomware incident? The, the 500,000 or like on the, the actual findings are talking about up to 3 million plus uh, for, for that typical cost of re responding and recovering from an incident. And that's not including lost product, lost productivity or revenue or whatever. So what if I want to hear, you know, at some point from people to find out, yeah, before we had this incident, you know, we had a tiny little budget, almost no people, you know, no one data point on some heat map to the board. And now we've got a legit, you know, this ain't going to happen to us again, at least not in a vacuum, because we have this big program now and we're spending a, a, a reasonable amount on it. Yeah, well, that's gonna, go ahead. Oh, I, I was going to go to the next slide, Sean, but I, I want to hear what you have to say uh, in response to Steve's comment there. No, I'm just with what kind of what Steve and what Paul had both mentioned, it's changed dramatically uh, from a risk. We, one of the things that Paul mentioned is understanding what the business, how they speak. And again, I break it down to that third grade level. If you can understand what the businesses are after and you can communicate the risk to them in their language, they're more apt to be open. And I, I'll use one example that uh, with Coke Industries, you know, Coke Industries is a very big company and we are global monster company. But the one aspect was, is we now have been in a position where the cyber risk was always there and it got more, but it really didn't get the level of understanding until, you know, things started seeing it. And now the, our leaders within our company are reading books like The Perfect Weapon by David Sanger. And they're, the leaders are reading that, that, the business leaders. So it's changed the paradigm with them. And I think that's also how we communicate to them is that if you're talking to those business guys, talk to them at their level. Because if you don't, you start talking just geek speak, they put you off on a corner and let you sit because they can't understand what you're saying. Boy, that's that that nugget there, Sean, tying the risk to the to the business impact. I'm going to come back to that before we're done, but that's that's spot on. Um, and Steve, when when you mentioned that the B word, it triggered uh, something in me, <laughs> the, the the board word, that we need to segue into this into this next slide. So I know we have a lot of um, um, senior leaders in the audience today as well. Um, so let's let's for a few minutes just talk about, you know, what how what do we communicate to the board? What what are they aware of? What do they understand? Um, and what are some of the themes that came out of the survey around that? So in in the survey, we found that twenty five percent of of organizations don't report any ICS or OT um, initiatives to their board. Um, and of those that do, uh, so the other, you know, 75%, some of the more popular topics are um, risk, risk, risk assessment results, changes in the threat landscape, um, and then more and more stuff around IT and importantly, OT vulnerabilities as well. Um, so Steve, I know you've, you've sat on boards before, you've certainly had to interact with them. Um, but have you seen the appreciation for cybersecurity change at the board level over the course of your career? Yeah, what was the word you used, Sage? Hey, you know, I'm an old guy. You know, I was around when there was, uh, you know, when the board didn't even talk IT, right? But in, in reality, in the past like 10 years or so, you know, I've seen a pretty big evolution person. I, don't, I have a limited visibility to boards, but the, from the people I know, uh, forums I've been in with other CISOs and then the, the limited amount of boards that I've been around, um, it seems like 10 years ago, it was zero <laughs> or, you know, if you got lucky again, back to my heat map approach, there was, yeah, we have a data element on the heat map and you had to try to roll up understanding of like uh, every control in IT and OT and try to put it into one bullet on a heat map or something, you know? Um, and I think from then until now, we've gone through some evolutions and I know everybody, every company's different in this journey, but I feel like, um, there's plateaus, there's, there's, uh, roadblocks, headwinds, that's a good word for it, that we have to overcome. You know, one of them is from moving from this data point approach to more uh, real world understanding and being able to paint a picture that's bigger and better than like compliance. You know, th there's there's kind of a misnomer, like we could we could put up a list of, of 50 areas and if they haven't, if they're there, they're green light, if they're not there, they're a red light. And we just go down and say, if 78% compliant, you know, or, or some kind of a metric that's tricky, like, unpatched systems versus patched, you know, how many vulnerabilities does it take for an adversary to get in, right? Not, you know, 10,000 or whatever, it's one, the, the right one. So it's like, it's, it, it, this is a huge shift from engineering mindset, you know, into a, more of an IT area where you have to assume the worst is going to happen and plan for that. You can't say, 
what's the frequency of this valve, you know, uh, breaking or something like that, like you can in engineering and math. So that's, I, th I feel like there's been a little bit of a move towards that away from the compliance based metrics into something a little more mature. Um, there's this also this, I don't know, I, I call it truth erosion. Like as, as, as stuff gets reported, even to the very first level manager, it's like, okay, the person reporting it has to try to paint it prettier than it is maybe because they've got conflict of interest. They, they, they get their bonus or their raise and everything based on things working well. So you, you have to have some sort of a separation of duties where the people that are discovering the risk and tracking it are not the people that are driven, the same people that are driving to overcome it and treat the risk. You know what I mean? They, they, if you have an incentive, human nature, I'm not saying anybody would even necessarily do this intentionally, but if you have an incentive, you got your family to feed, you know, you need that bonus, you need that Tesla you've been saving up for or whatever, or, or food on the table. And, and, and you have, you have to make a, a risk-based decision. Well, they kind of did something there. I'm going to give them a pass on that, you know, versus you get paid to find risks and track them and somebody else gets paid to remediate them. I think that those are the kind of things that somehow have to make it to the board and truth erosion has to go away where, where the board hears the hard truth. It can't just be reports. The board is, they're the geniuses, right? They're some of the geniuses that have to make business decisions. And if they don't have the real understanding of the risk, because it's all getting painted with pretty pictures as it comes up, you know, um, they're, they're not going to make the right risk-based decisions for the business. And there, there was so much sage in that response, Steve. That was fantastic. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, I, I realize we didn't budget enough time for all the, the collective wisdom here. Um, I do want to start wrapping up the slide. Paul, I saw you had a comment, so I'll let you speak. And then, Sean, uh, on, on this slide, if, if I could ask you to close with the question after Paul goes, um, it, it, within Coke Industries, what have you seen that's been effective to get IT and OT cyber leaders working together to improve board support? So think through that. And Paul, if you want to just share what you're going to say, and then I'll go over to Sean, then we'll wrap things up. Yeah, I was just going to... Uh kind of describe when in reporting to the board, we kind of wrap it up at almost the areas that you're, you're describing. But one is describe first the maturity of your program itself, because that kind of send, lends itself on the on your execution piece, not just how you adhere to a framework, but how, how do you actually execute with it with a, you know, CMM type of a model. So that way, you know how you're, you're actually delivering. Also get third party risk assessments to be able to assess how you're doing in those industrial control system areas. So that way you have a, a separate view that the board can look at and under uh, also assess. And then lastly, don't let your, your technical folks say everything's red in a control area because you have so many vulnerabilities or because then it would always be bleeding. You got to really take into account all of your compensating controls that you have in there and to, that says I'm reducing my likelihood. So that way you get a good sense that says, yes, although we're bad in this area, we have compensating controls that are gonna provide us within a risk tolerance. Now, you, what your job is, is to identify whether or not you're in that risk tolerance or not and let that board or, or their senior execs say, no, I wanna address that and then go, go have a plan to fix it. And then lastly, you know, you always have an updated roadmap of where you're going. Sean, is there anything you'd add to that? No, I, I that the biggest thing we've we've dealt with is the leadership here has been always open to challenge and they've always been open to sharing best knowledge and even our risk teams that are with Coke Industries have been very good to work with us on you know, how do we understand that risk and so I, the whole paradigm is changing for people and companies that are willing to embrace that the the cyber risk that they have and try to mitigate it are companies that'll be around for the long term. Agreed. Okay, so let's uh, let's jump through some of the different conclusions and, and recommendations. A lot of this you, you've heard our panelists share on the call today. Any one of these we could do a whole webinar on, but I want to be respectful of people's time. So first of all, you know what you want to consider doing is creating cross-functional teams. You want that cross-pollination to occur, uh, where you have representation both from the IT and the OT side uh, to bridge that cultural divide. Secondly, make sure that you, you do keep your board informed and that they understand the risks that are kind of business-driven approaches, uh, um, the, the different security safeguards, and, and importantly, what's the bottom line impact, right? Before you're in the news, what would the impact be? How do you plan around that? How do you prioritize? Because all these things do take time and money, so you want to have that board support uh, to make them happen. And link to that, of course, making sure you've got enough budget and personnel to improve some of the fundamentals, you know, asset visibility, threat visibility, 
managing vulnerabilities across all of your environments, hopefully in a coordinated fashion uh, that doesn't disrupt operations. And, and this is something we're seeing more and more. Uh, so start mapping out threat-driven and consequence-driven scenarios that could impact your crown jewels, right? Your high priority assets. This is something we're seeing boards waking up to. Um, and as leaders and as practitioners, the more informed you are about these different techniques, uh, the better that conversation will go. And then lastly, if you lack the resources, the skills, the expertise in-house, make sure that you lean on your partners and, and third parties to bridge some of those gaps, uh, whether it's like a, a rapid response retainer, whatever it is, but make sure you're quantifying the benefit or the, the risk avoidance in terms of what the business problem is. That's the language that the board needs to hear. Um, so talk in their language to get the level of support that you're looking for. Gentlemen, I want to thank you so much um, for your time today. This was absolutely fantastic. I think the audience has really been fortunate to hear uh, some of the incredible insight you've shared. I, I, I wish we had longer. I wish we could do a deeper dive, but we really appreciate uh, the time that you've, you've taken. I know there were some uh, candidates even with my comment on if you're looking for a career, let us know. I saw some of the chat and behind the scenes there. So this is a, a, a good chance to make those connections. I hope you get to them before we do, because we're looking for some of that good talent too. Um, but so if, if you want more information on the, on the survey um, or anything we've talked about today, here's a website address you can go to. And as I mentioned, we, we are looking for good people as well. So whether it's a fit with, within our company or one of our panelists, please, please feel free to reach out. We appreciate what you guys do. Thank you for your time today. Have a great week and take care.